Right, subcommittee um, hearing will come to order, and um, we'll start by recognizing the Chairman of the Government Operations Subcommittee, Mr. Meadows, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for continuing your leadership on this particular issue. As we look at that, many of you, this is not your first rodeo. You've been here before, and sadly, we're having to still address some of the major concerns that have been raised a number of times. Obviously, uh, we will end up uh, with a new IRS commissioner in, in the coming days, and as we look at that, uh, it is critically important that we set the stage for making sure that we address these issues. There are issues that uh, TIGDA continues to identify as problem areas. Um, uh, most of my concern, I can tell you, are, are the things that continue to make headlines. You know, why do we go in and we rehire employees when we have specifically in there, do not rehire? You know, the IRS is held to a higher standard primarily because you hold the American taxpayer to a higher standard. If some of the excuses that we use uh, as taxpayers were tried out in an IRS audit, uh, they wouldn't pass the smell test. And I guess what I'm here to say is some of the things that I am still seeing happening within the IRS does not pass the smell test. Now, I've been one of the few members of Congress who have had the opportunity to come and meet with some of the IRS employees, and I, I would be remiss to not acknowledge that the vast majority of them are excellent workers and, and truly are, are doing a very, very good job for the American public. However, when we start to see that we've got uh, 213 employees who were fired, who left the IRS while under investigation for a issue of uh, conduct or performance uh, that really was uh, was something that should have been addressed. We've got um, four of those employees who willfully failed to file even a tax return. Now, uh, I think the message needs to be clear. It's time to clean house. It's time to get it right. Uh, we're not going to continue to have hearing after hearing after hearing with no accountability. Uh, additionally, I'm, I'm very concerned with the number of IT recommendations that continue to not be fulfilled. And so I look forward to hearing your testimony because as we look at that, uh, IT security at the IRS should be priority number one. And yet what we have found over and over again is, is that we've got legacy systems, we've got out of date systems, and everything wants to come running back to the financial concerns, but I've, I've looked at, at the appropriations, I've looked at the numbers where they are, and there is not a linear co co uh, correlation between the amount of money that you get funded and addressing those problems. So what I wanna hear today is how are we gonna address the things that T TIGDA has brought up? We continue to see some of these mismanagement areas, and again, if we're not going to do it, I would rather hear under sworn testimony today that we're just not going to do it. Uh, I'm tired of excuses. Uh, at this point, let's get something on there. And uh, uh, again, it's very easy to become critical and have all the IRS employees think that this is about every one of them. I wanna be clear, this is not about every one of them. This is about management. This is about the, the failure to put in safeguards to address things that are important to the American people. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your leadership, and I yield back. Uh, I thank the uh, gentleman. Uh, Mr. Christian Morthy, the ranking member, is, is recognized, and we'll recognize Mr. Connolly when, when he arrives as well. Recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Jordan. Thank you, Chairman Meadows and Ranking Member Connolly for convening today's meeting, uh, hearing, and thank you for uh, participating in today's hearing. Uh, a 2013 GAO study found that there were 8,400 people with security clearances who owed a combined total of $85 million in unpaid federal taxes. Only half of this group already had a repayment plan with the IRS when their clearance was approved. Over 4,200 of these individuals were eligible for a top secret clearance. Although it may not be readily apparent, the IRS plays an important role in our national security apparatus. This is why the GAO recommended implementing additional security checks 
including rigorous background checks, providing proof of past tax returns, and working more closely with the Internal Revenue Service to weed out potential security vulnerabilities in our government. As I'm sure everyone here is aware, Financial pressure is one of the easiest ways for adversarial intelligence agents to recruit sources who will be betray our country. Outstanding debts are an overwhelming counterintelligence vulnerability. They make the debtor liable to pressure, seduction, blackmail, or any of the other tools in a, in a spy's recruitment handbook. In general, substantial financial debts could be used against an individual, particularly, particularly if those debts are owed to foreign entities or individuals. We must do everything we can to ensure that those entrusted with, our, with access to our nation's secrets are not, are not vulnerable to any sort of blackmail. And we would be abdicating this responsibility if we did not use Congress's power of the purse to ensure that every agency including the IRS, support our country's counterintelligence operations and has the means necessary to succeed. Given, the, given all the unknowns surrounding the president's tax returns and the over-leveraged over real estate holdings of his senior staff, we have an obligation to make sure the IRS is able to fully cooperate with the national security and intelligence communities to make sure they are able to assess and respond to counterintelligence vulnerabilities within our own government. I look forward to further exploring this GAO report and how the IRS works with other agencies to track these vulnerabilities and ensure that they are properly addressed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank the gentleman. Um, Today's hearing is entitled Ongoing Management Challenges at the Internal Revenue Service. That is a nice way of saying the IRS has been a mess and remains a mess. Um, rehiring employees who were under investigation, rehiring employees who were engaged in fraud, rehiring employees who were violating 6103, looking at taxpayer, confidential taxpayer information, awarding a contract to Equifax in light of the massive data breach, 143 million Americans' data breach, potentially, um, and never forget the backdrop. Never forget the backdrop here. Russell George became well known as the inspector, as, as TIGDA, uh, back in 2013, when we asked him to look into the fact that we thought maybe the IRS was targeting conservative groups, and lo and behold, they were. And never forget what happened when the IRS got caught with their hand in the cookie jar targeting conservative groups. They first denied it. Doug Shulman told the Ways and Means Committee way back then, oh, it's not going on. Guarantee it's not happening. Lois Lerner sat in our office, met with oversight staff, said, oh, not, not happening. Then they did what everyone else does when they get caught doing something wrong. They tried to spin it. Inspector General George remembers this. He was going to release his report on Monday, on the Friday before. Lois Lerner went to a bar association speech here in town, right, Mr. George? Went to a, went to a bar association speech here in town and had a friend ask her a question, planted question, and what did she say? She does what everyone does when they get caught. Said, it wasn't me. Nope, it was those folks in Cincinnati. Remember this? Blame someone else. First you deny it. Then you try to spin it and get in front of this story, which you did. Then you blame someone else. They all oh, rogue agents in Cincinnati. And then, when that didn't hold up, they even attacked Mr. George and Tigda for doing their hard work, for just presenting us the <coughs> truth. They blamed the messenger. They attacked the messenger. And finally, they resorted to the worst of it all, in my judgment. They destroyed the evidence. The IRS, 422 backup tapes containing potentially 24,000 emails that could have answered a lot of questions after Lois Lerner's hard drive crashed and it came up missing even though it was under subpoena, even though it was under a preservation order, they destroyed the evidence. And now here we set again, the IRS continues to rehire folks who violate 6103, look at confidential taxpayer information, rehire folks under investigation, rehire folks engaged in fraud award a no-bid contract to Equifax in light of the fact that 143 million taxpayers' information was breached. But here's the good news. At least there's one element of good news. The long, sad chapter of John Koskinen as IRS commissioner comes to an end in two and a half weeks, and thank the Lord for that. 
So I look forward to our witnesses and what they have to say, in particular the work that Mr. George and his team has done on a number of issues related to the targeting and the issues that we're also going to be asking questions and discussing today. And with that, um, since Mr. Conley is not here, I think we'll swear our witnesses in and proceed with their testimony and get right to uh, questions. It's, it's my uh, honor to uh, welcome today Mr. Uh, Jeffrey Tribbiano, Deputy Commissioner for Operations uh, Support at the IRS, Ms. Gina Garza, the Chief Information Officer at the Internal Revenue Service, uh, and of course, uh, the Honorable Russell George, Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, and Mr. Coots, the Assistant Inspector General for Audit um, at the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration. I want to welcome to all of you. I know, Mr. George, we appreciate you being here. You and I have talked on the phone, and we appreciate you making the effort to be here today. Uh, the custom of this committee is to swear people in, so if you'll stand up, raise your right hand. You solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Let the record show each witness answered in the affirmative, and we will move right down the line there. So, Mr. Tribbiano, you are, you are up first. And you know how it works. You've got five minutes and fire away. Yes, sir. Um, well, Chairman Jordan, Chair Chairman Meadows, Ranking Member Chris Morda, and members of the subcommittee, my name is Jeffrey Tribbiano, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Operations Support at the IRS. Joining me at the witness table is Ms. Gina Garza, the IRS's Chief Information Officer, and we appreciate this opportunity to testify. Each year, the IRS collects more than $3 trillion, processes more than 200 million electronic tax returns, and answers more than 60 million calls from taxpayers as part of its mission. These and many other activities are accomplished through detailed planning and coordination across the service. This includes critical support provided by the IRS's Information Technology Organization. In allocating resources for these efforts, our highest priorities are the delivery of filing season implementing congressional mandates, and protecting taxpayer data. At the same time, to the extent resources are available, we continue to invest in modernization of our tax administration systems and applications. To continue delivering on our priorities and modernization efforts, it is critical that the agency's IT infrastructure components be up to date. We continue to make investments in modernization of critical infrastructure using managed services and cloud technology to the extent possible. While we have seen some progress over the last year, additional investments are needed. We are concerned that the risk of a catastrophic system failure is increasing as our infrastructure continues to age. Replacing the, I, the aging IT infrastructure is a high priority for the IRS, but we are challenged by our budget situation. Our budget is now $900 million below what it was in 2010, and modernization at a faster pace requires significant additional resources for IT. We were also asked today to address the sole source contract award to Equifax in late September after the company announced a major data breach. At the beginning of this year, we recognized the risk of using only one vendor, Equifax, to provide the IRS critical identity verification and validation services. In February 2017, we publicly announced our strategy to issue two competitive solicitations, one for a short-term 12-month single award vehicle under GSA schedule followed by a long-term, five-year, multiple award vehicle. In July, we awarded a 12-month contract to Experian to provide these services. Equifax then filed a protest to the G Government Accountability Office, which had up to 100 days to render a decision. The protest triggered an automatic stay of contract performance on the awardee to preserve the status quo until GAO issued its ruling. At this point, overriding the statutory stay was not warranted under the circumstances. Equifax was satisfactorily providing services on the contract. There is no suggestion or evidence of any issues that would have caused the IRS to question Equifax's performance or whether Equifax's continued performance on the contract represented a risk to the government. We filed a motion at that time to dismiss the protest, but GAO denied our motion on August 2nd. Since the GAO decision was not expected until October 16th and the contract with Equifax was ending on September 30th, we were facing a lapse in identity verification services. This had the potential to negatively impact up to a million taxpayers. We believed it was critically important to maintain the ability for taxpayers to authenticate their identity to receive certain online services, particularly electronic requests for prior year's tax returns. 
This was sp specifically significant for taxpayers preparing to file returns before their extensions ran out on October 16th and for the taxpayers in the federally declared disaster areas. Several factors were considered prior to awarding the short-term bridge contract to Equifax on September 29th to include the GAO protest period, the time needed to transition to Experian, and the impact on taxpayers. And the results of our initial on-site security assessment conducted by the IRS team and the TIGDA special agents. However, on October 12th, after reviewing new information on Equifax's situation, we took the precautionary step of temporarily suspending the short-term bridge contract with Equifax. Now that GAO has denied the protest, we are moving forward with Experian. Lastly, we have also been asked to address the procedures for rehiring former employees. The IRS is committed to properly evaluating prior performance and conduct issues. We have in place procedures which we continue to refine to consider prior performance and conduct in the hiring process to extend permissible by law. And this includes implementing all of TIGDA's recommendations by October 31st of 2017. This concludes mine and Ms. Garza's opening statement, and we're happy to take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Tribbiano. Ms. Garza, is that accurate? You, you're, you're good? Okay. Mr. George, uh, you're up. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Jordan, Chairman Meadows, Ranking Member Krishnamurthy, and members of the subcommittee. I thank you for the opportunity to discuss IRS hiring practices and information technology challenges. As noted earlier, joining me is Greg Kutz, Assistant Inspector General for Audit. Tick the first reported in December of 2014 that the IRS had rehired 824 former employees with substantiated conduct and performance issues. For example, the IRS hired 141 former employees with substantiated tax issues, including five that willfully failed to file their federal tax returns. Other prior issues for rehired employees included unauthorized access to taxpayer information, leave abuse, falsification of official forms, and misuse of government property. In response to our 2014 report, the IRS said its, cur its current process was more than adequate to mitigate risks to the American taxpayer. In our follow-up Ju July 2017 report, we found that the IRS continued to rehire former employees with conduct and performance issues. IRS rehired more than 200 former employees who were previously terminated from the IRS who had separated while under investigation for conduct or performance issues. In response to our report, IRS management agreed with the intent of our recommendations and cited plans to update current practices. Bringing in employees with a history of problems increases the internal threat to taxpayer data. This leads to my second point. Information technology challenges facing the IRS. Recent cyber events show that bad actors are continually seeking ways to exploit IRS systems and access taxpayer information. The recent breach at Equifax could further increase the risk of identity theft. IRS continues to take steps in response to our recommendations, including implementation of two-factor authentication. The IRS has also faced significant challenges in modernizing its legacy systems and hardware infrastructure. For example, K2, which is a planned replacement of the master, individual master file, has been under development since 2009. The previous CADE initiative dates back to the late 1990s. Currently, there is no planned completion date for K2. The IRS has a large and increasing amount of aged hardware infrastructure, some of which is three to four times older than industry standards. The percentage of aged hardware has steadily increased from 40% at the beginning of fiscal year 2013 to 64% at the beginning of fiscal year 2017. This increases the security risks to critical taxpayer data the IRS must protect. The IRS has also been challenged in responding to some high-profile requests from Congress, the public, and the courts. The loss or destruction of information resulted from a combination of inadequate systems and policies along with human error. For example, systems and record retention policies have not ensured that email records were automatically archived and could be retrieved for as long as needed. We reported last year that the IRS's previous attempt to implement a new email system was unsuccessful 
at a cost of at least $12 million. According to the IRS, its future state email system was to be implemented by September 30, 2017. Until a solution is effectively implemented, IRS emails will remain difficult to retain or search. In conclusion, providing increased online access to taxpayers while protecting their identity and their information from internal and external threats is a substantial challenge for the IRS. In addition, modernizing systems would result in lower operating costs, increased security of taxpayer data, and improved customer service for taxpayers. TIGTA will continue to prioritize overseeing IRS hiring practices and efforts to address its information technology challenges. Thank you for the opportunity to share my views. Thank you, uh, Mr. George. Mr. Kutz, you're good? That's what I, th that's what I thought. Uh, the gentleman from Georgia is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It seems like dealing with the numerous challenges and crises at the IRS is a pretty regular thing around here. We've been through hearing after hearing uh, in this committee. And some, some issues, such as the technology, rehiring of employees, these things uh, are ongoing. We talk about them often, and rightly so. But sometimes there are new issues even to the IRS, such as this recent debacle with Equifax that has a lot of us uh, crawling in our skin. Uh, the common thread in all of these issues, regardless of the way they may be, is mismanagement. And it, it's not a management problem, it is a mismanagement problem. It's been taking place for years. And, uh, you know, it filters down from the top to the bottom and infects everywhere it goes. And as the chairman stated a while ago, I, I join in celebrating the fact that finally Commissioner Koskinen is leaving in a few days. And it is my hope that the tarnished agency that he leaves behind will finally get leadership that can correct the problems of mismanagement that are so abundant. Uh, I, I know there are good people, dedicated people at the IRS, and I don't intend or mean to throw all of them under the bus or any of those who are dedicated, but the, the mismanagement has got to come to a, to a stop. Um, now, I mentioned Equifax. Now, this is certainly a word that, at least now, probably everyone in America is aware of, and with good reason, uh, 143 to 145 million individuals who have had their personal information compromised, uh, where it walked right out the front door of, the, uh, of Equifax, and the, the report was widely reported, as we all know, of what happened. Uh, so, Mr. Tribbiano, Ms. Garza, let me just begin with you. Uh, the end of September, September 29th, the IRS awarded a bridge contract to Equifax after the data breach occurred. Um, I'm trying to wrap my mind around that. Did the IRS know about the data breach when they made this bridge contract? Yes, sir. Then why in the world did you make another contract? Well, we heard about the data breach the same as everybody else when Equifax announced that I believe it was on September 7th in the evening. On September 8th, um, our chief privacy officer convened our incident response team, which is made up of some of our senior leaderships, which is our CIO, our, our head of cybersecurity, the head of our business unit, uh, the, our chief contracting officer. And then we asked our TIGDA um, criminal investigators to join us on that day. And we made a call to Equifax to try to determine what exactly was going on down with Equifax. On uh, later on in the month of September, we sent that same team, IRS cybersecurity, IRS uh, criminal investigators, and TIGDA criminal investigators down to Equifax for a one-day visit to determine what happened, what was breached, how that activity happened, and what the impact was where the IRS did business. Are you getting to my question? I, I, I am, sir. I'm, I'm explaining the decisions that were made up to the point where we, where we uh, issued... My question, with 145 million whose personal data was breached, why in the world would you go back and have another contract with them? 
Well, because they, at that point in time, the, the systems that housed where we did business was separate from the systems that were breached. And there was, where, there was no indication and no security risk for where we did and exchanged information with Equifax. So you're saying that there's, there's no fear for the IRS with 145 million people whose personal information has been breached. You have no concern whatsoever that that may impact the, the security of the IRS type information no, of those sir. individuals? No, sir. I'm not, I didn't say that. What I was referring to was the information exchange where we exchange information at, with Equifax for our e-authentication verification. Part of the process that was, was we have gone through also at that point in time was to look at the impact of the breach of the 143 million, the information. Well, Commissioner Koskinen made it paraphrasing him. He said, it's no big deal for us to have a, another contract with Equifax because all these people's IDs have been breached already. So if they come to us, it's still breached. Well, sir, I can't answer for, mis for Mr. Koskinen. What I can well, tell you can you, answer for the IRS. This is another example of mismanagement that is poisoning the entire agency, let alone the citizens of this country. And Mr. Chairman, my, my time is running out, but this is, this is inexcusable, and I, I yield back. I thank the gentleman, uh, and it is inexcusable. Does the uh, gentleman from Virginia wish to be recognized now? Because we can go now. I thank the chair, and I note that he uh, noted my absence. But uh, I knew you'd be here, brother. <laughs> struggling a little bit to get here, but uh, to happy, to, happy to be here. And I thank the chair. Gentleman's recognized. And I'm sorry I'm out of uh, out of turn. Um, the IRS has suffered severe and repeated budget cuts since 2010. My colleague just talked about this functionality at the IRS as if Congress had nothing to do with it. The current IRS budget is 20 percent less than the FY 2010 funding level when adjusted for inflation. The IRS continues to face additional proposed cuts amid heightened demand for its services and additional unfunded mandates. These drastic budget cuts have severely weakened the ability of the IRS to fulfill its mission to enforce our nation's tax law and have not spared any corner of the agency. Most significantly, between 2010 and 2016, the IRS lost 13,000 employees. The agency's fiscal 2017 budget noted that every additional dollar invested in enforcement can produce $6 in revenue. That's not a bad return on investment if you'd bother to make it, but of course Congress has thought otherwise. And the additional indirect savings from deterring tax evasion can be three times that amount, an 18 to 1 return on investment. However, between 2010 and 2016, the IRS was forced to reduce its enforcement staff by 11,600 full-time employees. That's a reduction of 23 percent. Even Secretary Munchen at his confirmation hearing expressed his concern about those staffing levels, saying, and I quote, I am concerned about the staffing at the IRS. That's an important part of fixing the tax gap. And also noting, if we add people, we make money. That's not Obama's Secretary of Treasury, that's Trump's. IRS employees are not the only ones affected by those budget cuts. The American people have felt it as well through diminished customer service, quality, reliability, and including, of course, longer call waiting times and delayed tax refunds. I'm most alarmed with the IRS budget constraints impeding the ability of the agency to update its out, outdated IT systems, delaying more than 200 million in investments. IRS has legacy IT systems that date back to the Johnson administration. In a September 2017 report by the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration notes that 64 percent of the agency's IT hardware infrastructure is beyond its useful life. I, I will say, parenthetically, I am informed that the good news might be that the Chinese don't know how to hack into COBOL. It's too old. So we, IRS software is also shockingly out of date. Thirty-two percent of supporting software, two or more releases behind the industry standard, and 15 percent more than four releases behind. The legacy systems are a catastrophe waiting to happen, and it's critical they be upgraded in order to adequately protect taxpayer data and provide the modern services the taxpayers deserve. I understand we're not going to have political agreement in this committee about 
the role of the IRS and its importance and centrality to a functioning government. But surely it seems to me we could agree that modernizing IRS's IT infrastructure is necessary to prevent cyber hacks and will improve customer service, customers who are our constituents. I know our committee, Mr. Chairman, has led the way on IT modernization throughout the Federal Government. It's time we did the same for the IRS. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from uh, Illinois is recognized for his five minutes of questioning. Then we'll go to the gentleman from South Carolina. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Um, I, I guess I'd go to you, Mr. George. Oh. And uh, if go that way, that's all right. Sorry. If I, I'm, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. We'll, we'll go that way. No, no. Which way? Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. I, I think we should. I think we should probably go because Mr. Collins yeah, yeah. is doing his opening statement. So oh, please, next please. line oh. is the ranking member. So we'll, he's yielding. We can't both yield. One, he's yielding to you first, so you've got to take it, man. Okay. Then we'll go to Mr. Sanford. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to focus a little bit more on this security clearance uh, tax issue. And, um, you know, since 2010, as, as uh, Ranking Member Connolly indicated, IRS funding has been cut. And, in fact, in fact it's seen its funding cut by 17 percent. And it is performing the lowest levels of individual and business audits in a decade. This is at the same time that the GAO has recommended increased coordination between the IRS and the Director of National uh, Intelligence. Mr. Tribbiano, how have these cuts impacted the IRS's ability to effectively work on security issues and coordinate with other agencies? In its 2013 report, the GAO urged the Director of National Intelligence, the Office of Personnel Management, and the Department of Treasury to evaluate the feasibility of federal agencies obtaining data on federal tax debt when evaluating security clearance applicants and monitoring current security clearance recipients. Could you, could you illuminate this a little bit? Um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can anytime there's reduced resources um, within the IRS, our prioritization is always uh, is making sure that we can deliver a safe and successful filing season. It's important to us to make sure that we can process the returns, get the refunds out the door, and complete that work. The second prioritization is always whatever um, legislative mandates that are out there that we have to implement. And third is obviously overriding cybersecurity and protecting the data that we have. Whatever's, whatever resources we have after that then go into a prioritization for whatever projects we have to work on. The, the project that you're referring to, um, being able to provide data, at least the status as, as uh, security agencies are doing su suitability assessments on possible government employees, um, took us a while to, to, work our, to work the funds available to start that process. Now, I can tell you this, we are ready um, to provide that service. The, what we do is we don't provide taxpayer data. What we do is we get the name and the information from the, the projected candidate and we tell the suitability agency whether or not there's a outstanding liability, not a liability, or there's an issue that you need to contact us about. But we can't release taxpayer data to them because the, a lot of these uh, agencies don't have <coughs> the built-in um, ability to protect taxpayer data. So we, we, let we, me, let me, let me interrupt for a second. I'm going to lose all my time. One, one quick question, which is you're also on those tax returns. You would know whether there's federal, uh, whether there's income from foreign sources, right? Um, if they were disclosed to the IRS. If it's disclosed to the IRS, we would know that, but that's not part of the suitability. My understanding is it's not part of the suitability. The suitability is whether somebody has an outstanding liability um, to, the, uh, to the government that the IRS has on that. And if record. they asked you to provide information about income owed or, or debts owed to foreign uh, uh, actors or income received from foreign actors, you'd be able to provide that, right? Well, we're not, we would not, we are not ready to provide that. And it's a, 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 um, a privacy issue in the sense that we, if we release data like that, there has to be protections in place on where it's going and what's being done with it. We just can't release taxpayer data um, without having the proper authority to do so. So that's why on our suitability, we provide whether or not there's an outstanding liability to the, uh, to the federal government that the IRS has on record. And then the suitability uh, professional that's working on security clearances takes that into account on whether or not that person would 
that you know the information we provide would uh, create an additional risk in their in their assessment of that individual's um, background. Okay, um, you know, make no mistake. In these situations, the IRS is as valuable an intelligence collecting agency as the FBI, in my opinion. Um, I'm from Chicago. And it wasn't the violence or the speakeasies that brought down Al Capone. It was the IRS that nailed him on tax fraud. I'm very concerned that we're now impeding the ability of the IRS to protect us from threats much greater than bootleggers or gangsters. Um, you know, Mr. Tribiano, has the IRS been cooperating with Special Prosecutor Mueller's team as he seeks to unwind the extent to which Russia has been interfering in our elections? Uh, sir, I, I would have no idea that's out of, outside of my purview. And, um, I, even, if I, even if I was in my preview, I wouldn't be allowed to discuss any ongoing investigations. Um, are you aware of any political appointee from any agency seeking to exert pressure on the IRS to not cooperate with Mueller? Uh, sir, again, I, I'm, not, I'm not subject to any of those activities within the IRS. Uh, you know, I can tell you the IRS has only two political appointees in our entire 80,000 structure. That's the Commissioner of Internal Revenue and the Chief Counsel. That's it. All, all other employees within the IRS are federal employees. I'm, I'm just really troubled by some of these answers. I just don't think the IRS is doing enough to assess the financial liabilities of um, those who you know, seek security clearances. We've heard repeatedly, repeatedly about people on SF-86 forms with all kinds of entanglements, financial entanglements that, of which the IRS should be aware if it's not already. And I'm just troubled that this information is not being shared across the government. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from South Carolina is recognized. <clears throat> um, thank the gentleman. Um, it, it seems to me in the back and forth that the, uh, a, a fairly central question that's emerged has been, has the cut in funding in IRS resulted in its inability to do things? And so I guess my question to you, Mr. George, would be this. One could argue, I think fairly reasonable, that you know, the number of agents would impact audit capacity. I don't know that one could argue as reasonably that some of the cuts in funding with IRS would affect essential management decisions. And fundamentally, when you look at this notion of rehiring folks that have been dismissed for a variety of different reasons, fundamentally you're looking at a management decision rather than a capacity decision. I think that the cross tabs are here especially interesting because um, you look and you all had studied this issue back in 2014 and at that point roughly 11 percent of the employees that had been dismissed had been rehired. You studied it again in 2017 and 10 percent of the folks that had been dismissed had been rehired. In fact, with the cut in funding, actually there had been a 1 percent or almost a 2 percent increase in lessening the impact of rehires of mismanaged folks. So it doesn't seem to me that there's any correlation between amount of money and, again, one's propensity to go out and rehire somebody that was dismissed. Could you give me a little bit of further thinking on that? I agree with everything that you stated, Congressman. Um, I guess the only thing that could be said in defense of the IRS's actions is that a lot of the rehires are temporary IRS employees during the fouling season in order to process the millions of tax returns that come in. They bring in people who have had experience doing that in the past. But they've had fundamentally bad experience. They have either done wrong, committed malfeasance, uh, not filled out their own uh, tax returns, a variety of different, uh, they've been uh, uh, um, dismissive to a superior, they've uh, been insubordinate, go down the litany of different possibilities, you fundamentally go back and hire somebody like that to increase, quote, capacity. It seems to me uh, you would diminish capacity. And it is a bad decision making on their part, whether it's 400 or whether it's one, that rehire should not have occurred. We agree completely. We hope the new commissioner will be more proactive in avoiding this in the future. Um, and, but we will, I can assure you, sir, be uh, on top of this issue from day one. Again, Mr. Tribbiano, uh, again, you look at, again, the cross tabs and the numbers, you got less money, but actually 
had fewer faulty management decisions by about 1.7 percent in the, the, again, the difference between 2014 and 2017. Your thoughts on that? I mean, fundamentally, again, it speaks in not to money being the issue, but management being the issue. Yes, sir. So, so let me first start by making sure I make it clear. We have a credibly dedicated and talented workforce, and I, I want to echo what what um, again the that disclaimer I think has been laid out by a variety of different members. I don't think we're questioning the whole of many people who work there. We're questioning the management process that goes out and rehires folks that have been found not worthy to be in the agency that that that, that does have capable people in it. So, so let me let me answer yeah. your question because you you are associating that with funding, and there is a funding issue when, you know, when when we wait have wait wait again the numbers speak for themselves. You had 1.7 percent less in the way of rehiring folks that had been dismissed after you had less money. Yes, sir, and and I'm trying to get to your answer. There's a lot of different factors that go into that. When when in 2014 TIG laid out the recommendations that they wanted the IRS to follow, they implemented those recommendations. It probably um, um, caused some of those numbers to drop down, but some of the issues are related to funding, and I don't want to discount that, and I can get to that in a minute. But I can tell you the fundamental difference now between what TIG recommended this go around and what we are going to do to to stop this process from happening, and what we what TIGDA called the light for us is we do a suitability check, right? So we go by OPM standards that states clearly if somebody had this disciplinary um, issue, concern, problem, after, after X number of years, OPM tells you whether or not they're suitable or not suitable, whether you can take that into consideration or can take that into consideration. Wait, if, based on your own filings, you have the words, do not rehire on there, and you still go out and rehire, that doesn't if, seem to me to fit with anybody's standard of it, common sense. It, it fits within OPM's guidelines about and what's suitable would you define, and what Would you define that as common sense? No, sir. So let me just, if I can just finish the statement so we, we're all on the same page. Mr. Chair, can I have a, uh, can I have a few minutes or a few sure. extra seconds, sure. please, sir? Thank you. So, Ms. Stanford, so what, what we're changing in that process is two, twofold. One is we do the suitability check and we find that there, there's an issue or concern or some type of problem with the employee. We now tag that when we send that to the hiring manager so the hiring manager knows there's a suitability issue with that individual. That's what TIGDA's recommendation was because that, gets, that allows us to still meet the requirements with an OPM but notify the hiring manager that there's an issue. That's number one. Wait, number wait, two. Wait, 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 let me just. I'll let you finish the thought, but but since we've already gone over, yes, uh, uh, this is what makes people crazy. Uh, in other words, you have just defined this process uh, as being outside the bounds of common sense, and yet you describe a circuitous process by which supposedly it checks somebody's box as being okay. Yes, but it doesn't pass the common sense what, test, which I think is the ultimate test. What, what I what I re, what what I described is the the rules that are that I have to follow in order to meet OPM's requirements, right? That yeah. I cannot operate or expect my people to operate yes. outside of. But but if I could just Tribiano, finish the that. point is, was it reduced resources that caused you to rehire someone you had said don't rehire? Was it reduced resources? that led to a decision to give Equifax a no-bid contract 30 days after they said 143 million Americans had their, their data compromised. Yes. That's Mr. Sanford's point. And frankly, any American who looks at that says there's no way reduced resources caused the IRS to make those decisions. They just made those decisions. The reduced resources, call, it, it affects every part of the IRS. It's not just our revenue agents and revenue officers. It affects our contracting folks. It affects our HR folks. So the last, the last thing I would just like to say, we are seeking. And, and it affects your ability to read. Do not rehire, and yet you rehired them. Sir, according to we got to get to the other side here. I'll keep finish your thing, then we'll get to okay. uh, this. Uh, Mr. Thank Comment. you, and I appreciate some leeway there, Mr. Chair. The uh, the one thing that we are requesting to try to, to to get to your common sense approach is we're working with OPM on getting debarring authority to where if we can for for those items that 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 reach that level that OPM will approve it that we can debar those type of fractions from being part of the suitability and remove them from that. But that's, that's the context of what we have to work in on some of those rules that are out there. So that, that debarring authority can help prevent some of these activities. And, I, and again, I'm sorry that I, I ran over. Gentleman from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess I'm not surprised Mr. George would say something like, I agree with everything you said when listening to my friend from South Carolina. My friend from South Carolina has executive experience, so do I. 
I helped run one of the largest counties in the United States. And I can tell you this, at some point, you do less with less. The idea that there's no relationship, which I think I heard my colleagues say, no relationship between resources and functionality, capacity, whatever, is an absurd proposition, and I don't think any sensible American will buy into it. And so we have a smokescreen going on in terms of the dysfunctionality of IRS and decisions made or not made. But where Americans really care is where they intersect with the IRS. So Mr. Uh, Tribbiano, um, have the cuts that have ensued since the Republicans took over the Congress, coincidentally, in the 2010 elections, uh, have the cuts had a material effect on the quality of services by the IRS? Yes, sir. The, uh, I, I would say any reduction in resources at... at no, 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 no. I'm asking specifically. I don't want to hear general. That's what Mr. Sanford was talking about. I want to hear specifically. Let's test his theory. Has there been a deterioration in customer service at the IRS in the last seven years? Yes, sir. Why? Because we don't have the, the resources uh, to perform all the compliance reviews that we need to have. Uh, we're down uh, revenue agents and revenue officers, which means we're, we're doing less compliance across the board in so, all areas. So, for example, are there fewer audits of tax returns? Yes, sir. Why is that a bad thing? I mean, a lot of Americans might welcome the fact that you can't audit me as easily as you once could. Well, our tax system is built on voluntary compliance. If people don't feel that there's any repercussions um, from compliance purposes, then there's a tendency to move to... Isn't there also an equity issue? So people who are cheating don't get caught because you don't have the resources to do the audit to catch them while law-abiding citizens are paying their, their fair share of taxes while someone else is getting away with not doing it. We, yes, sir. We've had few cr uh, criminal convictions from our, our, our criminal investigators, and it's not because there's less criminals out there. It's because we have less resources. Do you remember what the estimate is every year of taxes owed but not collected? Because this committee's had hearings on that subject. Um, I don't recall it right now, sir. Does the figure $350 billion ring a bell? That, that, that sounds... Isn't that, that, that amazing? It, it's 450 actually. I'm sorry. Thank you. 450 so we're testing Mr. Sanford's theory here of resources have no relationship to capacity or functionality. $450 billion of taxes owed left on the table every year. Now, I don't know, I'm not that good at math, but times 10, that's $4.5 trillion. You want a down payment on the, on the debt? There's a good way to start without raising anyone's taxes or without cutting vital investments for the United States. But that's, so what about Mr. Tribbiano? Has it had a material effect on customer service? Have waiting times gone up when I call the IRS? Or do people pick up that phone right away on the first ring and whistle while they work? They, our waiting times have, have gone up. Uh, this last filing season, though, we, we, we allocated more resources uh, that we had to that. So we, we did a better job in it. But if you talk to anybody that waits for any amount of time on a phone, it's not good enough. Now, I talked about legacy systems and the lack of an investment, and Ms. Garza, certainly pipe in if you'd like. What, what can go wrong with having legacy systems that are 50 years old and uh, hardware and software that's way beyond the industry average in terms of lifespan in an agency that keeps data on every American in terms of financial data paying their taxes? So the age infrastructure, the risk, which is one of our biggest risks at the IRS, it creates instability in the systems. So um, you end up But specifically, Ms. Garza, my time's running out, what's the risk we worry about here? The, if I got, are these systems capable, all of them, uniformly of being encrypted? Isn't there a privacy concern for Americans that when you're dealing with aging hardware and software, they're more vulnerable? For, it depends on where you're, you're talking. We have a perimeter, uh, a secure boundary around our systems um, that is very, uh, what we call a very hard shell that protects the systems that are inside. Yes, I think OPM thought it had one of those too. Mr. Tribbiani, did you want to cro uh, comment on that before my time ends? Um, I, I agree with Ms. Garza. I, I could just tell you that I, I worry about system failure during filing season. That's my number one concern because if we can't process returns, refunds aren't going out the door, and that could have a large effect on this economy and uh, taxpayers. So I worry about that, and I also worry about cyber and, and everybody 
um, in government should be worrying about cyber. But those are my two biggest. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank my colleague from South Carolina for being willing to test his theory. I thank the gentleman from Virginia with the committee's indulgence. I'm going to let Mr. Sanford respond just for a few minutes. And if the gentleman needs a few more minutes, I'll do the same, and then we'll get to our other, our other uh, questions. Um, I, I appreciate so much my colleagues. Uh, a lightning fast mind of uh, certain parts of his movie, uh, body, maybe not moving as fast as they have in the past, but his mind is certainly not fit into that description. Um, I appreciate his intellect. Um, uh, and I just say two things. One is that hyperbole is often the, the, the way of politics. And there's a little bit of hyperbole in what my dear colleague is suggesting in that I even seeded the point, which is to his point, I think that if you look at call times, wait times, uh, audits, there are a number of things that could be in legitimately impacted by cuts within the IRS. My point in the rehire question, and that's why I differentiated, was to say that doesn't seem to be the case on the rehire question, given the fact that if you look at the numbers in 2014, or rather, yeah, 2014, you had 11.7 percent, in essence, misfire there. And by 2017, it had gone down to 10.65 percent, a drop of a little over a point, even though there was less money. And there seemed to be reverse correlation there. There could be a variety of different factors at play there, but there seemed to be a, a difference in the cross tab. So I'd say that the money begs otherwise, and I would certainly cede the larger point to my colleague with regard to audit and other. I would also make this point. This isn't a South Carolina perspective. This is a perspective, and therefore I would ask you to take it up with Mr. George, that is held by the Inspector General. My numbers are simply coming from them. I'm reading off the numbers that I see from the Inspector General, and that's why I think it was so instructive. When I walked through my numbers, he said, I could not agree more. With that, I'd yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank my colleague for his clarification. And uh, I, I didn't have time to go into the rehire issue, and I take his point. Um, I thought Mr. Tribbiano was trying to tell us that there are OPM rules about rehiring and that they have to go to first. I don't know that Mr. Tribbiano adequately addressed the Chairman's point and your point, Mr. Sanford, but if there was a note saying don't rehire, does OPM still require you to do that? Because that doesn't make sense to any of us. Well, there's the, what OPM requires, sir, is a suitability. There's, there's lengths of time that, that after you exceed that length of time, that violation, issue, whatever you want to call it, is no longer part of the suitability check, even though you have a record that says an individual was AWOL from work or absent without leave, I'm sorry, from work. Um, after a certain number of years, that, that is not part of the suitability. So, so uh, my time is going to run out, but let me ask this. So do we need to change the OPM regs? Because it sounds like they are making you do something you would prefer not to do. I, I would, if you're, if you, I would leave that up to Congress. I would say it would be, it, it would allow me more flexibility to be able to manage the agency differently. And that is why we are seeking that debarment authority, because that will allow us then to block out major infractions and say, look, we can, we can use this debarment authority and meet those common sense standards that, that Mr. Right. Mr. Sanford was referring to. Thank the Chair for his consideration. Yeah, the gentlelady from uh, the district is recognized. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I think it only fair to Mr. George to lay to rest uh, uh, notions that rang throughout this committee for a long time. The false narrative that the Obama White House had directed the IRS to target conservative groups for political reasons. Uh, one of my friends on the other side said it was, quote, basically an attempt to muscle anyone who, in their, who is their political opponent and to use whatever power they have at their disposal to intimidate people they don't agree with. So there was an accusation that from the top of the government, from the White House, yeah. that uh, there was an, an, an attempt to essentially commit fraud, frankly, with the IRS. Um, now, in 2013, uh, TIGTA, and you know that, of course, is the Treasury Inspector General, conducted an audit of the screening procedures used to process uh, applications 
for tax exempt status, which is what this was all about. Is that not correct, Mr. George? That's correct. Uh, in that audit, that audit, and here I'm quoting from it directly, found ineffective management allowed inappropriate criteria to be developed, uh, resulted in substantial delays, and allowed unnecessary information requests to be issued. As a result of that audit, therefore, uh, Mr. George, there is no evidence of political motivation, is there? Uh, that is correct, and I've stated that from the outset. Yes, you did. I just want to lay this on this record, given the hullabaloo that went on for at least two years on this question. And, Mr. George, you found absolutely zero evidence of White House direction. Is that not correct? That is correct. On September 27, 2017, uh, TIGVA released a follow-up report looking at additional material not included in the 2013 audit. Is that not true, Mr. George? We did. This new report confirms that it was both progressive and conservative groups that received extra scrutiny in the application process and that there was no political targeting, that groups with progressive, with Occupy, with green energy in their names were pulled for additional scru scrutiny. They too were subject to extended delays in the processing of their applications and they too received unnecessary questions. Is that not true? That this, whatever was this faulty management <laughs> uh, applied to groups that consider themselves liberal or conservative and groups that consider themselves uh, the opposite and that both were victims of this management failure at the IRS. Is that not true? Uh, yes, but I need to qualify something. Um, as it relates to progressives, we, I will agree that that is what you stated was accurate. As it relates to the other groups, especially the ones that you deemed conservative, we not, neither in 2013 nor in 2017 made that decision to determine the political leaning of any group. Now, I don't understand what you're saying. You, you, underst you, you understood the political leaning of the left-wing groups or not the right-wing groups? Well, only because progressive and through the work of my chief auditor on that matter, who happens to be Mr. Coots, who, with your permission, I'd like to defer to. I'd be pleased to hear from uh, you, Mr. Coots. Elaborate on that. Yeah, Councilman, we didn't label anyone anything in either report, but the criteria that were in Well, you know, I'm, I'm using quotation marks here. I'm not labeling them. Okay, I'm, I'm using quotation marks on the report. Progressive, Occupy, uh, Green Energy. Organizations with those terms in them did receive delays similar to the first report. Mm -hmm and did receive unnecessary questions. It wasn't the same magnitude, but there were some that did. That is a fair statement. Uh, in fact, none of the procedures in place at the time of the inappropriate criteria uh, are still in place at the IRS today. Is that not correct? They stopped using the be on the lookout listings in June of 2013. Uh, my only uh, reason for, for going over this again, and I thank you both for this audit, uh, is that it did not seem conceivable to some of my friends on the other side that there was management disarray, that it had to be political. And I must say, when you go so far as to say that the White House itself is, is directing civil servants uh, to look into groups based on their political background, that is so serious that it needs to be laid to rest right here, and I very much appreciate your coming forward. I very much appreciate the second audit. Uh, I very much appreciate that I believe the work you have done, which is objective, and as always has been, as Mr. George has said, he's been a 
been before us at, at, at length on this matter. Now with you, Mr. Uh, Kurtz is also involved. I believe we can put this, this matter to rest. It's a shameful period in, in the history of this, of this committee. And I yield back. Mr. Kutz, the 2013 audit that reflected what was going on with Tea Party groups had a BOLO list, right? That's correct. And the BOLO list said this, 911, excuse me, 912 Tea Party conservative. Those were the targeted terms. Is that correct? Only Tea Party was on a BOLO list, but the other ones IRS confirmed were being used to pull cases to for pull that cases. bucket. Those groups ex received extensive scrutiny. They were asked about what they were praying, what kind of prayers were given uh, at, at those meetings. Isn't that correct? There were seven unnecessary questions that we looked at. Very, and, very t unnecessary privacy invading right. kind of questions. It, 98 organizations in the first report received these unnecessary questions. And the, almost questions. all of those were conservative groups, correct? We, we did not assess no, that. No, they were. I, I saw the list. They were almost <laughs> all conservative groups. We've all seen the list. Everyone knows it uh, was conservative groups. The audit that the gentlelady is referring to went clear back to 2004. And some of those groups that received extra scrutiny deserved it. Acorn-leaning groups deserved it, right? Wasn't that audit from 2004 to 2013? The second audit covered the period 2004 to 2013. Yeah, completely different context. Correct. Some of those groups probably deserved scrutiny. And, and just the, the argument itself, oh, because liberal groups were also targeted, somehow it's okay? Nobody should have been targeted by the IRS. But we know in 2010, 11, and 12, the Inspector General, the the, the uh, investigation we asked Russell George and you guys to do in, to, in 2013 about that, that was totally focused on conservative groups. And now to say, oh, a second audit that went clear back to 2004 somehow justifies that, oh, no, was everyone got caught up in this, is just complete baloney. And everyone understands that. Now, to the issue at hand today, four people at the IRS were rehired who had been terminated or resigned. Is that, is that four people who had had some kind of violation with 6103, is that right? They willfully failed to file their federal tax returns. That's correct. What about, uh, what, was there anything relative to looking at information regarding 6103, violating 6103, uh, examining stuff that they shouldn't have been able to look at? Was, yes. was, wasn't there four employees who had, had been involved in that? Those were additional employees that had unauthorized access to taxpayer records, yes. And were those four people who had unauthorized access to taxpayer records, were they terminated or did they resign or how were they let go from the IRS? One of the two and then they were hired back. They either would have been terminated or they left before they got, you know, in the federal government. So they were in the process of getting fired. Correct. That's correct. For fraud, for looking at taxpayer information they weren't supposed to look at, right? For substantiated, unauthorized access to taxpayer records, yes, sir. So they were terminated, resigned, and they got rehired? Yes. Okay. Now, do we know anything about these people, these four people? Mr. What division, Chairman, do, they, what division do they work in? Mr. Chairman, are you using your, uh, an additional five minutes? Because you used it both to try to refute what I said without giving me any ability to respond. And now you're going on to the second issue. I mean, how is this subcommittee being run, sir? No, I have not taken my five minutes. I, I, I have not. I have did my opening Mr. statement. I've not taken any five minutes of questions. So you believe you're within five minutes in, in, what, in what's happening here now? This is my five minutes. Well, Go ahead, Mr. Chairman. The last time I checked, every member was entitled to five minutes. I've not had five minutes. Well, then be our guest, sir. Well, it's not about being your guest. It's <laughs> I happen to get the privilege. I, I the made an inquiry. You say you're tech, taking five minutes you did not have. No, I was no, not no, aware no, of that. No, I was not aware of that. So you did not have if, Well, if we can stop the time now, now, the way it normally works is I gave Mr. Connolly I know an how it works, sir. Mr. Christian Morthy an open statement. Mr. Meta is an opening statement. I took an opening statement. So we had four opening statements, ranking member, chairman. I have not taken five minutes of questioning, and now I'm taking my five minutes of questioning, and somehow you say that's wrong? That's how it always works. Go if ahead. You, oh, if you want the chairman of the committee not to have five minutes of questioning, then. I didn't say that, Mr. Chairman, so don't put that in my mouth. Well, then, well, then I, why, I, why the interruption? Well, because I didn't, it seemed to me that you were over your five minutes. I did not realize you had well, not had five minutes. You, you have spoken often this, this afternoon, therefore I did not realize you had not had your five minutes. I've spoken sir. to recognize the gentlelady for D.C. Well, for yeah, I'm, obviously I'm not talking from, about that. Okay. Uh, so tell me about these four people. They were terminated uh, and resigned. Do we know what area they worked in? Actually, all 213 that were rehired in the second report were in the wage and investment division. And, and they were positions like data transcribers, contract representatives, tax exam technicians. So even though some were, temp were temps, they had access to taxpayer records and sometimes were dealing with taxpayers. 
And what, what was the time frame when they, when they were working and got terminated? What, what time frame? They were rehired between January 2015 and March 2016. They had been terminated before that period. And had they worked, the four that I'm concerned about who access, had access to unauthorized information, who access unauthorized information, were they, um, were they here during the targeting uh, time, during 10, 11, 12, 13? I'd have to get back to you for the record on that. Do we know if any of them had contact with Lois Lerner or anything like that? We, we don't know that, no. You didn't look at that? We did not look at that, no. It seems to me it's, that, that's, that's something we should, uh, we should look at. Uh, unfortunately, my time is out, even though I lost a minute in a debate about something that shouldn't, we shouldn't have debated. So I'll, I'll come back and take a second round. But we will now go with the gentle lady from Illinois, I think, is recognized next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Under the IRS Restructuring and Reform Act of 1998, Congress granted IRS the authority to hire a limited number of individuals to staff critical technical and professional positions in the agency at salary levels greater than general schedule rates. Congress intended this critical pay authority to help the agency attract highly qualified individuals with advanced technical expertise who might otherwise um, be unavailable for government service at normal federal salary levels. The IRS used this authority from Congress to fill a total of 168 positions from 1998 to 2013, many of which were positions in critically important areas such as information technology and cybersecurity. Mr. Tribbiano and Ms. Garza, does critical pay play a role in making federal government jobs more appealing to highly qualified technical individuals who might be interested in public service but could be earning a much higher salary in the private sector? Yes, ma'am, it does. And, and it's and to emphasize it's streamlined critical pay. And, and the streamlined portion of that is really important because what, what that allows us to do is to go out into the private industry, find somebody that's on the cutting edge of technology, let's just say in cybersecurity, and have them sitting in the chair working for the IRS in a matter of weeks than the months, four to six months that it could take going through the normal federal hiring process, and then be able to offer them a salary that maybe it doesn't meet industry standards, but offers them uh, something that, that makes it worthwhile for them coming on board. And that, that's a key aspect, and, and I'll let Ms. Garza get into this. It's a key aspect to, to getting, again, individuals that, that um, have a cyber background, architectural background, engineering background, those technical skills. And I can tell you, some, a lot of these uh, private sector individuals would love to come into government if it was easy, right, and that streamlined process, add value for the amount of years that that authority was in place for, and then go back to the private sector. Can you tell me um, how big the gap is between uh, federal pay and a private sector? Just a guesstimate. Um, well, I'm, I'm a little outdated. I've been in federal service for a few years now, but when I was in a private sector, it was a, uh, it, it's a substantial uh, pay reduction to enter federal service. You, when I came in, I, I came in for the factor to serve, um, and that, that was worth taking less money and less benefits in order, in order to serve. Oh, I didn't know if you were going to say something. I was going to, I was going to yield it to Ms. Garza for any input on, on, on the technicality. So, <clears throat> on the, on the, tech, on the crit streamlined critical pay, um, some of the areas that were of great benefit um, was cybersecurity. We had critical pay, streamlined critical pay that we got off the street that was extremely, um, very technical, very good, ran our CSERC operations, uh, and he's since uh, left the, the IRS. Also in our engineering and architecture, um, we had a, a very good group of uh, streamlined critical pay that really helped shape the direction that we were going uh, from a technical perspective. Um, they've all uh, left the IRS at this point. In testimony before this committee last year, IRS Chief Information Officer Terrence Milholland stated, and I quote, making progress at a faster pace on transitioning our legacy systems will require significant sustained additional resources in the IT area. Would those resources include human resources, such as individuals qualifying for, uh, qualifying for critical pay? Yes. I, I think that's probably our biggest risk is the, the human resources um, that we have lost over the last several years. Um, my, I'm the ranking member on the IT subcommittee, and my chair, Congressman Will Hurd, has often talked about what can we do to work out something public-private or some kind of uh, 
system where maybe someone from the private sector is on loan to us, you know, for a little while. What do you guys think should happen, or any ideas? Well, the, the streamlined critical pay, pay. <laughs> the, the streamlined critical pay authority that we had in place that expired that that we placed back in our 2018 budget allowed us that capability, allowed us to bring in private sector individuals for shorter periods of time, and then they can go back out into into the private sector, or in some cases, some of them. Uh, love federal service and compete openly for federal positions. I think if we continue down that path and, and, and concentrate on the streamline uh, portion along with the critical pay, but it, to me it's both pieces of that, uh, because there is an authority, there's an authority that OPM has out there, and I think TIG decided in their report, it's not streamlined, but it does allow critical pay. The, 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 the issue is, and, and, and TIGDA um, um, recognized this in their report, although I think there's a few more, out of the 800 positions, at the time TIGDA did their analysis, there was only four of them that were able to get through the process. I think it's a little bit greater than that now. And we initiated that process to try to see what it takes to, to offer that. But streamlined critical pay, again, allows us that authority to get them in the chair quickly and then to be somewhat competitive with salary, but not matching the private sector. Uh, Comparison. Yeah, um, the OPM program is, is not as attractive either. It only offers $207,000 of pay versus the streamlined critical pay was $240,000. So there's two ways to deal with this. Either give IRS streamlined critical pay or strengthen this OPM program that has 800 positions available that only four are being used government-wide. I'm out of time, so thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. The gentleman from Wisconsin is recognized. I'll pass for now. Gentleman from Iowa is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to uh, our panel for being here today. Uh, appreciate it very much. Mr. Is it Tribbiano? Yes. Are, are you responsible for the hiring and firing decisions in the IRS? I oversee the human capital function within the IRS. You oversee. Yes, sir. They, I've learned all kinds. I'm from the private. Well, sir, I mean, I'm from the private sector. I've learned all kinds of new terms uh, here. Uh, you oversee it. So are you yes, responsible sir. for it, or, or I not? am responsible for the human capital aspect. Yes, sir. The human capital aspect. I was reading your bio here. It said before joining the USDA, you worked in the private sector yes, with multiple high growth organizations. Yes, sir. Question I have for you. One of the many is, in the private sector, uh, would they rehire people the way uh, the IRS does? people that may have been under investigation, people that may have been uh, under investigation for tax fraud, people that, uh, whose personnel files said do not hire. How would the private sector, your experience been, how would, how would they handle that? I, they go through it. Any difference? Uh, yes, sir, there's a difference. They go through a process. I don't think, uh, in my experience, and again, this is my experience, uh, there's less uh, rules and boundaries that you have to operate in within that. So, In the private sector? Or yes, sir. In the private sector, there's less boundaries that box you into certain scenarios. So it's a, it's a streamlined process. If so, so we have more boundaries, more rules, more regulations in the public sector, safe to say, in hiring and firing, and we get worse results. I, th I, would, I would say mean, that mean, not saying the employees are bad, but we're rehiring up to 10 percent of people that have been terminated from the, the agency prior. I, I, is that true? Is that true? Mr. Kurt, Kurtz, is that true? It's 10 percent of the former IRS employees that were brought back. That's correct. That, and were they terminated with cause or did, were, were, did that 10 percent, did they leave on their own accord? Well, they either were terminated or they were going to be terminated and left before it. And we. I literally, I'm from the private sector, can't believe this. We would hire back 10% of people we were going to terminate. Does that strike you as incredible, Mr. Kurtz? Yeah, and I th I, they didn't have to do it, okay? That, and our issue was the, the selecting official is the person we think should get the information to make the decision. I don't think it prevents that from happening. There are suitability issues at the end, but I don't think that's our big issue. Our issue is earlier in the process, we believe a selecting official should have the information to make a decision. That's where the, the bad decisions are being made. In fact, there's, there's not a decision. You're, you're sitting there with candidates as a selecting official, and you don't know the derogatory information that we, you just described in making your choice. Does that make sense to you that they don't know that? Well, no. That's why we made the recommendation that they change the process. Mr. George Tigta issued a report this past July, correct, on the problem of IRS rehiring employees previously fired by the agency. This isn't the first time a report like that's been issued. Is that correct? That is correct. That report documented that you issued an instance when the IRS rehired somebody who literally on their personnel file it said, do not hire this person. That is Can correct. that possibly be correct? That is correct. I mean, it sounds like not a good situation to me. 
Doesn't sound like something, private sector's not perfect. Doesn't sound like something that would happen in the private sector. Did the IRS adopt your recommendations, Mr. George, on this topic? They have in the, in principle, in the most recent report. Again, we issued a previous report in 2014 on the very same issue. Uh, they said they were going to adopt. They did in, in I'm sorry, you, they did in principle? Is yeah, that what you said? In, in, the current, in the current one, they're, they're in process. Of they're in the process of adopting them. Correct. Yeah, yeah. And, and how's that process going? Is it's there a sense of urgency there? Yes, sir. Um, we will have that. As evidenced by what? As evidence as, as we're going to have it in, implemented and running in October when we start our, our filing season hiring to bring back the, uh, the, the part-time, as you called them, but we call them seasonal employees. So we, we took all the TIGNA recommendations that came through, and we're implementing them right now. We'll have them done. We're on target to have them done in October. You know, I represent the eastern part of Iowa. It's kind of a blue-collar district. I go out there and talk to the factory workers, and I tell them, you know, if you were terminated by this company or going to be terminated, do you think you'd ever get rehired again at the same company? I mean, that would be a laugh line. It, it, can you see why, why, why people out in the, in the real part of this country think what's going on here is nonsensical? Why, why there needs to be change? Why we need to drain the swamp? These are the things that I don't even want to repeat because it's embarrassing. Do you understand that? I mean, do you hear that? Yes, I, I understand, I understand what, what this looks like, and we are doing everything possible right now to put those things, to put the recommendations from TIGDA, plus some additional things, like I said, about seeking debarment authority from OPM to be able to put more controls in place to stop this from happening. But you said previously more controls and more regulations. I think you said pens you in, and now you want to put more no, regulations in no, place. No, sir. These are not controls that come from OPM. I'm referring to internal controls, management controls that we administer at the IRS to be able to stop this type of activity uh, based on the recommendations from TIGDA from happening. These are recommendations that TIGDA came forward with that we are adopting and implementing. And I'm, I'm, t I'm stating that we will have that in place in October to be able to monitor, to provide the, what, what Mr. Koontz talked about, which is giving the hiring manager the suitability and the issues with, with, with prior. This will be in place next month? This will be in place at the end of October, yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, can we follow up to make sure this is in place by the end of October? Because these are the very reasons why yep. there's so little confidence in uh, the federal government out there in the real world. Uh, so I would say time is of the essence, and I look yes, forward to you doing that. Yes, sir. Uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman, the time I do not have. Yeah, I thank the gentleman uh, for his good question. The gentlelady from New Jersey is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a quick yes or no from you, Mr. George or Mr. Coots. IRS has a lot of uh, improvements to do. It. Is it moving in the right direction? I would say that, especially in the wake of the 2013 issues and yeah, yeah. a few of the other ones that well, occurred after that, that they are taking quite seriously okay. uh, the issues that we have uncovered. And would it be very helpful if they had the resources they needed to get you modernize their equipment, their IT equipment, et cetera? Would that certainly be of help? The IRS, if it had additional resources, could do more. Thank you, sir. Um, I am going to take us off into an entirely different, but I think vitally important area here. As the House prepares to vote on a budget resolution this week to begin the process for enacting massive tax cuts, I want to take this opportunity to question the witnesses here today about the proposed drastic changes to our tax code. Since unveiling their tax reform plan last month, Republicans have tried to claim that their proposals to cut taxes for the wealthiest Americans will somehow benefit the hardworking middle class families. But even the Treasury Secretary himself called his party's bluff, stating that it is, quote, very hard, unquote, not to cut taxes for the rich, and that repealing the estate tax, quote, disproportionately helps rich people, close quote. In fact, many of the people who stand to gain the most from the Republican tax plan are President Trump and the Cabinet. Would any one of the witnesses here disagree that repealing the estate tax, which limits the tax breaks granted to the wealthiest 0.2% of Americans, disproportionately help rich people, as the Secretary conceded? I, I just had something in front of me. I just, it That's a yes or no. Well, 
no, ma'am. Tax tax policy is the purview of Treasury and Congress and the administration. We the so we, you really don't you don't we, know the answer to the questions, ma'am. We are tax administration. Okay. Laws get passed and we administer. Thank you. In fact, eleven members of the Trump administration are included in the 0.2 percent, according to the Center for American Progress repeal of the estate tax would position heirs to those 11 cabinet members and the president's family to gain almost $3.5 billion. Just to put that number into context, that $3.5 billion is about one-third of IRS's fiscal 2018 budget. Is that correct? Yes or no? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. That doesn't sound like helping middle-class working families and hard-working men and women. The Republican plan also proposes changes to the tax on the income of pass-through businesses like LLCs, which are not subject to the standard corporate income tax. The Republican plan would cut the top rate on this income from 39.6% to 25%. This is 10 percentage points lower than the top rate imposed on individuals and would not benefit the 86% of pass-through businesses that already pay a tax rate of 25% or lower. Again, this would profit only millionaires who the Center on Budget and Policy Priority finds, quote, receive about 80% of the tax cuts in 2018. Again, this doesn't sound like helping the middle class or the working class families that, that make up this middle class, but it does indeed directly help individuals in the Trump administration. The president stands to receive a tax cut of almost $23 million from this proposal, while senior advisor Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, could receive a cut of 6 to $17 million, and Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos a cut of 3 to $5 million. Does that sound like benefiting the middle class or working families to anyone here? I don't think so. But that isn't all. Republicans want to eliminate the alternative minimum tax under which President Trump was forced to pay $31 million in taxes he could have otherwise avoided in 2005. Of course, that was well over a decade ago, and we don't know how much this tax has cost the president since given his refusal to release his tax reform reforms. Uh, Mr. Tribbiano, this is something that you can't answer, I think. Is the President uh, Trump under audit by the IRS? Ma'am, I, I cannot discuss any audits or anything uh, of that nature, um, and I actually wouldn't know who's under audit. My, it's not part of my, my responsibilities. With would you know if he actually paid any taxes? Ma'am, I would have no idea. Is there anything that stops the, uh, uh, an individual under audit from releasing his tax returns or her tax returns? Would you know the answer to that question? No, ma'am, I do not know. Would anyone know the answer to that question? Is there anything that stops an individual who is being audited from releasing his or her tax returns. Does anyone know the answer to that question? My understanding is there is no restriction on that. I didn't think so. We already know that the Republican plan will benefit the cabinet members, but if the president wants anyone to take seriously his claim that their tax plan won't benefit them at the expense of working men and women and their families, and he could prove it just once and for all by showing America the money he has and releasing his own tax reform forms. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think the lady, the gentleman from uh, Wisconsin, is recognized. Sure, a couple of questions, Mr. Tribbiano. How many employees in the IRS? Um, give or take, depending on filing season, close to eighty thousand employees. Eighty thousand. Wow. In, in every year, in an average year, how many are terminated? Um, I, I don't have that number, so I can get that for you, though. You guess, Wiley, any of you Inspector General guys have a stab at that one? Actually, no. We don't have that information, sir. I can get I can get that for you and get back to you. Yeah. Why don't you tell me how many were maybe terminated in the break in between how many? Is there a probationary period? Um, yes, sir. All federal employees have a probationary period when they enter federal service of one year. Um, well, well, give me two statistics. Give me the number of make it to their probationary period and the number once you get by the probationary period where I let go every year. Can do that? Yes, sir, I can. Now we're going to, we got a little, little explanation for our listeners back home. Could somebody describe the Taxpayer Protection Program? It's supposed to be something designed to uh, strengthen um, catching suspicious tax return filers. You familiar with that program? Are you guys doing anything you must be doing? Um, right now we are looking at tax reform. And there are feelings that particularly on, on some large refund returns, particularly earned income tax credit returns, that people are lying and getting big refunds. Have you, are you familiar with that problem? 
Mr. George. I mean, we are familiar with that problem and are quite concerned, sir. Uh, the instructions for the earned income tax credit are more than 30 pages, uh, single-spaced, uh, double-sided. Uh, it's an extraordinarily difficult credit to implement, both from the perspective of the taxpayer and then from the perspective of the IRS to ensure that the, that the information they're receiving is accurate. Uh, what we're especially concerned about, sir, is many of the instances in which we find that people are inappropriately receiving that credit are a result of returns that have been prepared by professional tax preparers. So people who are supposedly trained and, and have the expertise to do this are doing so in a way that gives people credit or credits that they're not entitled to. And is that to. the fault of the preparer or is that the fault of garbage in, garbage out? We have concerns that it's both, sir. Okay. Um, you said it's an overly complicated credit, and I, I can't imagine why anybody would pass a law requiring 30 pages of instruction, but apparently people around here did, and that's one of the problems the IRS has. And it's not bad IRS employees, it's bad congressional employees. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry, sir, but in, in that arena as well, and I'd like to echo what Mr. What Mr. George said, we, we can't do the verification up front. The, the, we, we don't have the authority to, to do that. So if the return gets processed through the system and we have to pick it up under compliance to see if there's an issue. Um, we, we've been asking for and seeking correctable error authority uh, that would allow us to match up when those returns come in during the processing cycle, match up the data that's on there with some of the uh, federal government records and make those corrections while we're processing the return. Because if, if it goes in, it has to be picked up under compliance in order for us to... to, to and compliance it, means, what is that, in other words, for audit? audit? I mean, an audit, yeah. audit or review. Now, the, the PATH Act helped uh, in, in a portion of that. Um, and, it, and it allows us that capability to try to match stuff up before, before we release um, refunds. But correctable error authority will help us go further um, in, in that arena. If you had to guess how percentage-wise, how many of those returns, say, say not ones where you get a little credit of 45 bucks or something, but say credits in excess of $2,000, what percent do you think are fraudulent or they have errors in them? Well, the overall improper payment rate for earned income tax credit is about 25 percent, but they don't all meet the criteria you just described. There could be some small ones and other types in there. But the overall has been steadily in the mid-20s for over a decade. If you had any other federal program and 20 percent of the credits going out the door were wrong, were wrong, would you continue that program? It's not the only one. There's the other credits that IRS have very high improper payment rates also. Which other ones are those? The child credit and the education credit. Both have very high. Well, we, we've got a Ways and Means Committee looking at that. Maybe those are three things we ought to, ought to take out of there because we're looking for ways to simplify these returns and get some cuts on the middle class. So could you give me a little or could you guys forward to me, for me to forward to the Ways and Means Committee, a little more information on the education credit and how you think people are cheating on that one, the child care credit, child, child yes. credit or child care credit? The, the child credit, I don't know the full name of it, but it's a child credit, yes. Okay, the child credit, and particularly the earned income tax credit, because uh, there's some people who want to, you know, do tax reform around here. We might as well make sure we get it done right. We might as well make sure by the time we're done with this, we don't operate any slipshod program. Thank you very much. Gentlelady from um, Illinois is recognized. I see that wrong. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Representative Lawrence, generally from Michigan, is rec recognized. Thank you. I'll charge that to your head, not yeah. your heart. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> uh, since 2010, the actions of the congressional Republicans have drastically reduced both the IRS budget and your workforce. The IRS has lost over one billion in annual funding and 18,000 employees since 2010. During that same time, IRS workforce has steadily increased. Over 10 million more tax returns are filed annually. This year, IRS is cutting its seasonal workforce during tax filing season by 2,000 people. Is that correct, Mr. Tribunio? Um, 
Yes, ma'am, that, that, sounds, that sounds close to being accurate. How does cutting 2,000 workers during your tax season affect the quality of customer service that taxpayers expect when they call IRS? Well, it, w it would definitely impact our ability to provide you know, uh, taxpayer service. Th this area is, is a little bit outside of my purview. It, it really falls on our, our service and enforcement side, the deputy commissioner that oversees that activity. Um, who's on this panel that can tell me how this is going to impact what the taxpayers will receive from the IRS? And then you talk about quality in the error rate and fraud rate. If you're having an increasing number of tax returns with mm -hmm. significant budget reductions, who in here is going to tell me that the IRS has any chance of being effective? Uh, Congressman, they are directing people to their online irs.gov website to assist uh, in areas where in the past people could go to taxpayer uh, assistance centers and or other uh, IRS-funded entities. In addition, they also refer people to volunteers to help uh, complete their tax uh, filing obligation. Uh, and that system is fully up and running? Uh, it has been, the, the, sitting out to the volunteer aspect of it, and of course the website is. But not everyone has access to computers and the yes. internet, and not everyone can get to one of the centers or to one of the uh, locations where the volunteers are. So there's no question. Uh, a cut in resources in the terms of uh, human relations or employees will affect uh, the length of time and the ability of taxpayers to receive assistance. How does, uh, does IRS has any more plans for staff reduction? I, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't. Does IRS has any further plans to reduce your workforce pursuant I, I, to the President's executive order that directs all agencies to create a workforce reduction plan? Oh, Ma'am, we've been under a workforce reduction plan for the last five years, and each year we steadily lose our, our, our total headcount. Mm -hmm. our, 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 we are a, a people-driven agency, and our funding, the majority of our funding, um, goes to to, to the workers within the IRS. So when we have reduced funds, we, we hire less um, in certain areas, and we try to focus uh, the hiring to the greatest need. Uh, but we also have um, some constraints on our, our appropriation language. I know that's not this committee, but there's constraints on that that, that state what, are, what type of appropriations could be used for what type of work. And that also causes some, some uh, imbalances in our workforce. But we've been slowly reducing our size. Now, I can tell you, you know, ma'am, you mentioned about 18,000 employees, and I think that's right. It's between 16 and 18 when you, when you count fluctuations mm -hmm. in seasonal. Um, I don't think we're ever going to get back to that, and I don't know if there's a need to, but there is a need for, for, for more work, and we, we, we don't have enough staff to be able to adequately service the taxpayers, to have the right compliance levels out there to generate revenue, and then to, to support that with our, with our management and administrative interior support that helps support that activity. So I don't think there's anybody within the IRS that says we should go back up to the levels we had. I don't think that's reasonable. But I, ha I, have, I have a quick question. So if this new tax code is passed, has any of you been in the agency long enough to go through tax change or tax code process? Doesn't that include the need for additional staff to implement, train, and to enforce new tax codes? Um, at, at the sides, ma'am, not something as comprehensive as is being discussed, but to their credit, the IRS has demonstrated an uncanny ability to implement tax law changes even at the very final uh, portions of the tax. So, year. sir, if I can quote you, you're saying that if the proposed tax chain program passed, at your reduction workforce plan, at your reduced, at your reduced level that you are at now, without the manpower to ask, ask individual questions, sending them to a website, you are confident that the IRS will just absorb this 
and the world will continue, and you will provide the quality expectation that our taxpayers expect. Gentleman can respond. Yes, no, no, no ma'am, I, I am not, no, I'm not confident. It depends on me. We haven't seen the language at the IRS because, again, policy yeah. is, not, is not what we're about. We're about administration of that policy. Exactly. We haven't seen it either. But, but if, it's, if, it's, if it's complicated, it will definitely have an impact, right? Because we have to be able, if, if we're changing the, the, the actual structure of a tax return, that has a big impact on our IT systems. And I can let Ms. Garza talk about that. But there are implications of that. And anything that's retroactive has, has a big impact on, on our ability to, to administer or try General, to get the systems up. The lady from New York is recognized. I just want to thank the chair. Since oh, thank he you. didn't remember my name, he gave me an extra minute. That's thank right. you. Anyone from, from the great state of Michigan, even though I'm from Ohio, uh, we will do that. General lady from New York is recognized. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Tribbiano, uh, la la last month Equifax uh, announced it had suffered one of the largest data breaches in history, compromising the personally identifiable information of more than 145 million Americans. That's almost half the country now has their social security number and their date of birth compromised. And while that in itself is troubling, what is perhaps even more troubling is the fact that hackers roamed the Equifax network for more than two months without detection. And the company waited weeks, absolutely weeks, to alert the FBI after learning about the breach. This is simply unacceptable. I will hope that the chairman of this committee would commit to holding a hearing on this matter. But today, I, I want to delve deeper into the, another fact of the issue, the IRS's contract extension with Equifax while waiting for a ruling on a bid protest. And I'd like to ask you, uh, Mr. Tribbiano, is it correct that the IRS extended a current contract with Equifax after the breach was revealed? How much was the bridge contract worth? What was the length of the bridge contract? What services were covered by IRS's contract with Equifax? Yes, ma'am. So let me let me just let me start with the bridge contract itself was for three three month increments. Right. So when, when the reports came out that it was 7.3 million, that was for the whole nine months. The intent of the bridge contract was to be able to cover the time period from uh, the, first the first three months, which was worth about 1.3 million. And the intent of that was to cover the time period between GAO either upholding the protest or not upholding the protest and our ability to get the new vendor online and up and running. So we had to have a bridge between between those two, those two contracts. Um, and what services were covered by this contract? E-authentication services. Uh, this is where a taxpayer um, would, would provide certain data uh, that we would verify with Equifax to be able to verify the identity of the, of the taxpayer. Okay. I mean, I'm and, simplifying And it's, that, it's my understanding that after the breach was announced, IRS personnel were sent to Equifax to assess whether IRS data was compromised, and Ms. Garza, can you describe that assessment and its findings? Yes, so we went, we reached agreement with Equifax to do a one-day visit, followed by a three-day visit, which we did conduct uh, last week. On that first day visit, the primary uh, objective was to um, look to see if any IRS data had been compromised and also working, partnering with TIGDA Investigations, look at what data had been. Was it compromised? No. No, no IRS data had been compromised. Well, that's good to hear. But I'm, I'm concerned that shortly after the breach, IRS entered into a short-term bridge contract with Equifax. Shortly after reports of this sole source bridge contract, I sent a letter to Chairman Gowdy and Ranking Member Cummings requesting a hearing on this $7 million no-bid contract. Ms. Garza, can you elaborate on that contract and why did IRS enter into it despite the rising concerns with the laxity of, of, of Equifax in, in, in their identity and theft protect, protection to be hired to then uh, verify protection further at the IRS is uh, deeply concerning to me. 
So yes, ma'am. I'll, I'll I'll start if okay. I can, and then okay. I'll, I'll turn it over to Ms. Garza for, for for some of the technical technical aspects of that. So when when I originally was tr discussing this earlier, and I forgot who asked who asked me the question, I was trying to um, lay out the 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 pattern that happened. So right now, we, we had a sole source contract with Equifax as our sole vendor in this arena for, for a long time. We recompeted that contract, and that's the one that they protested, to bring other, other uh, companies into the fold and have them offer this service as well. Experian um, met the qualifications from a technical perspective and put in a lower bid than Equifax, and they won the contract. So now we have competitiveness. When GAO put the stay out there, we, we and, and knowing that GAO has up to 100 days to, to decide on, on whether or not the, the well, protest well, is. Well, my time is almost um, up, and I sort of know it, which the whole line of circumstances. Can I ask, given the circumstances of the bid protest and the data breach, were there any other options the IRS had besides extending the contract with Equifax and tempor temporarily discontinuing the services that were being provided to consumers? We, well, ma'am, we could have we could have discontinued the service, or we could have provided the the bridge contract. The the what you heard from GAO when they they talk about the authority to be able to uh, there's a higher authority level that you could override a, a, a protest or, or start the process of implementing something in the middle of a protest, we didn't breach that, that, that level to be able to exercise that, that option. My time has expired. I have further questions and we'll submit it to the record. Yeah, we, you. If you want, we can do, do a, a few more here. Right. Mr. Coots, the, the 200, was it 213 who were fired and then rehired? 213? Correct. Okay. Fired or left in lieu of termination. Yes. Yeah, and, and uh, when when they were rehired, there has to be some kind of interview process, some, something that goes on. Do, do, in that interview process, does the IRS say like, oh, I see you were employed at the, at the, at the IRS before um, and you were let go. Do they, do they get into that questioning? They may get to it in suitability, but they don't get to it when the selecting official is making the decision to make the offer. That person does not have the derogatory information in front of them, which is our primary concern here. But someone at some time knew this, this person was fired, and now they're back in front of me seeking employment at the very agency that fired them. Yes, it's in IRS's database called alerts. It's right. right in there. Okay, so, so four people were fired for looking at information, private taxpayer information that they were not entitled to look at, right? Correct. They were fired for that. They are now back in front of the IRS wanting a job, and someone says, has that information in front of them, said you were fired for looking at confidential taxpayer information and now you want to come back and work for the, for the Internal Revenue Service. And, we, so, and somehow that gets moved along to the next level where supposedly they don't have this information. Is that accurate? Well, no, I think the bigger issue is they don't have that information. And, and this, you know, it's a selecting official who has people who are best qualified. They get onto their desk and that person does not have the information you just described. I think that's what we want to happen here. We want the person making the hiring decision to know the derogatory but someone, information. someone in some point in the process did have that information? They may have it after the offer has been made, but if it's a suitability issue, as Mr. Tribbiano has described, they can forget about it if it's more than five years old or six years old or there's other circumstances where it doesn't matter. And that's what he's talking about. How can about. it not matter that people were accessing confidential taxpayer information, were fired for it, are now back in front of the IRS asking for a job and are going to have access to that same, same kind of confidential taxpayer information. Because the OPM process for the suitability forgives certain things after a certain period of time. It's mitigated by time. And there's no obligation on the part of the person seeking employment to give, give that information? Well, when it gets to that point, you can't say, you can't reverse it. You could have reversed it earlier in the process. That's why we wanted it earlier in the process. When the so officials making the selection, okay. you can do it then. So they need to do it earlier in the process. Absolutely, um, absolutely crazy. Uh, Ms. Uh, Garza, uh, let's go back to the, the previous questions. The 145 million, 143 million, uh, that number that Equifax announced, what relationship does that 143 million have to people who file with the IRS, if any? What's the overlap? How does that relate to the Internal Revenue Service? We don't know what that overlap is. Uh, we went in to, and just looked at what data elements had been compromised. But, it, I, it, I mean, it, 
I mean, it, it would have to be substantial because there are 330 million people in the country. There's probably 150, 160 yeah. million taxpayers, right? So of it's, course, there's, yeah. a, there, there's an assumption that, you know. Potentially every single taxpayer. A good portion of those are, you know, directly related to taxpayers. Yeah, maybe all of them. It, 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 it would have to be so. Um, this is announced that there's this major breach, 143 million Americans, and um, one month after it's announced, you do this no-bid contract to Equifax. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and Ms. Garza, you testified before the Ways and Means Oversight Subcommittee that you had no knowledge of the short-term contract prior to it being made public. What I testified was that I did not know it was signed at, on the 27th. Why would you not know that? It was not an IT contract. It was actually um, administered from the um, IA, uh, Identity Assurance Office. Yeah, but you're the chief information officer, right? You're in charge of all this stuff. Then the contract was for professional services for uh, credit bureau, and so the, the folks that were involved in establishing that contract uh, deemed it that it did not have to come to my organization for review. Any services or equipment that are used in automatic acquisition, storage, analysis, evaluation, manipulation, management, movement, control, display, switching, interchange, transfer, reception, information. Again, that's the definition of information officer. I just find that hard to believe that you had no idea that this was, this was happening. It was, I knew that there was, um, there was a problem with the uh, original Equifax and there had been a protest, but I was not involved in any discussions about what was to occur, how we were going to mitigate um, the situation. But you obviously knew there was a contract with Equifax at the time that they announced the breach, that the IRS had a contract with Equifax. Yes. Yeah. And you knew it was up for renewal? Yes. And it gets renewed without your knowledge? It, I did not know the specifics, and I was not involved in the conversations that went to making that decision. So this is, I mean, again, this is what drives Mr. Heiss, our, our, the, the, the first member to question today, this is what drives Americans crazy. We didn't know that we were rehiring people who committed fraud. We didn't know that we had 213 folks who had been terminated who are now back in front of us, we're going to rehire them, and they looked at confidential taxpayer information in a way that they weren't supposed to, and we didn't know, even though we had a contract with Equifax, even though we knew it was up for renewal, even though they announced 143 million Americans had their data compromise, we didn't know, and I had no part, it's like this passing, this is what drives them crazy. So again, let's hope it all clears up when, uh, when Mr. Koskinen is, is stepping down and we get someone new to run the place. The gentlelady from D.C. is recognized if she'd like an additional uh, few minutes. Can you share? Thank you. I wanted to stay to, to ask a, a question, and by the way, I, I'm not sure how the IRS is going to know anything if we keep cutting their budget. Um, but I'm concerned uh, for federal employees that work at the IRS because there have been reports of really vitriol well beyond. I think this question is for you, Mr. George, because I think that this was um, reported uh, to, to, to the IG. Um, uh, it's clear that, the, that IRS employees have uh, had um, increased, in fact, a marked increase in the number of threats. Uh, apparently, there have been 1,556 investigations into possible threats since the beginning of the year. Um, and there have been prosecutions, apparently. Um, I was very concerned that uh, uh, commercial uh, trucks uh, and I must indicate that these reports say that the Trump Hotel is very close to the IRS, so some of this may be people from God knows where uh, protesting that, or they're protesting the IRS. So it makes this a volatile shot, uh, uh, spot. Um, the, uh, it, what the report, and these are news reports, uh, said that commercial trucks, Ubers, and taxis are not being checked by canine and magnetic wands and that they are parked, allowed to park and idle between the hotel and the IRS building. 
uh, employees say that they that were particularly concerned, because all of us may have read about this as well, about the arrest in May of a man from Pennsylvania who brought a whole cache of weapons and 90 rounds of ammunition into the Trump Hotel parking lot. Uh, so he was somehow caught. Uh, I'm gratified to say he pleaded not guilty, but then he, uh, and of course, uh, after, after arrest, uh, uh, pleaded not guilty, but while, while he was out after that, um, awaiting trial, prosecutors said he posted dangerous anti-government messages on social media. Now look, I'm a First Amendment abs absolutist, but when prosecutors say that, that there may be a crime here, I do pay attention. Uh, I, I wonder, uh, before something really serious happens, uh, Mr. George, whether or not there ought not be an investigation of what is a very unusual number of threats against federal employees who they say make it difficult to do their work. I'm looking to you for advice. Uh, sometimes they don't even know who to, who, to, who to complain to, the police or the IG or the FBI. Uh, is, 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 would an investigation help to put to rest where the problem is and what should be done about it? Uh, Congresswoman, that's a very t important and timely question. And in fact, we are currently working with the Internal Revenue Services Security Division on that very issue. And so I don't know whether we'll be able to report publicly because we don't want to endanger, again, further endanger the lives of uh, IRS employees or other federal workers or private citizens who are there. But um, we would be happy to brief you and the chairman and the committee on what we find in well, a non-public setting. That's very engaging, uh, very encouraging, Mr. Uh, George, I would take it, though, that after uh, a report, I mean, after an investigation, some kind of report that the public could see uh, would be uh, appropriate. We, uh, I, we're not asking for uh, reports of who struck John or what to be done about it, but it would be reassuring, just as I am reassured by knowing you are indeed involved in an investigation. At the end of that investigation, surely there's something that the IG's office could, could say uh, so that, for example, people would know that, that various, various steps have been taken, uh, et cetera. Is that not possible? I will certainly take that under advisement, and I'm certain there would be a possibility for us to issue a somewhat redacted version that wouldn't endanger uh, security and methods and sources, but nonetheless inform the public and the IRS employees about what actions have been taken. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. George. I appreciate that kind of initiative. Certainly, ma'am. Thank you very much. I'll give just one question. Maybe you guys aren't qualified to answer because it's really not in, uh, along the same um, vein as the other questions today, but I'll, I'll try to ask you, Mr. Triviano. As you know, we're working on a major tax law change, which more, may or may not come to fruition, probably will. But there are people here who want to make sure it's done by the end of the year and make it retroactive on the 2017 returns. Uh, are you familiar with how the IRS handles tax changes passed in November or December retroactively? Um, but, sir, I, I, I haven't been uh, with the IRS uh, for, for a major tax change like this. I can tell you, though, talking to my colleagues, and I know Ms. Garza can add, add some some uh, additional comments on this. Talking to my colleagues about this, it depends on the on the complexity of what's in this law or what gets passed. And if it's retroactive, it does cause it does cause us concerns because we don't have enough time internally to make the changes right. to the systems to educate our phone assisters and the people that would the the influx of people asking tax questions plus our our partners um, out there the the um, software companies that produce the software that, that, that a lot of Americans use uh, need time to also to be able to build into their software whatever these changes might look at. Yeah. But, um, Maybe I should ask Ms. Garza, what happens if there's even a minor change in December? Because we've done that before, a retroactive change Yeah, it really depends on the change uh, and what exactly is being changed. One of the things that is probably the, the most difficult to implement is um, if you change the what we call the record core record layout, which is kind of the how the return is structured. It has all of the business rules associated 
um, and those are all programmed. So if, if you're going you know, from a two-page uh, 1040 return to a one-page or a postcard type, that's significant work. On, on the other, on going back in time, making it retroactive, that is very difficult because we have to go back to our systems. Depending on how the language is, you know, how far back do we have to go and how do we apply that to things that have already occurred? One of the things that I would suggest is, uh, and I'm sure it's probably already happening, is that we engage with, um, with your staffs to figure out what's the best approach that we can use to still get you to where you want to get, but make it in the, mo in the simplest way. You're, you're going to have to come up with new instructions for the returns, right? Yes. New instructions, presumably for the Schedule C, presumably for the Schedule E, and many other schedules, right? How quickly in today's world do you think you can turn that around? I mean, these are not obscure schedules. So this, uh, the development of the schedules actually comes out of our WNI organization. So I don't know um, how long that, that would take for them to do. I, I, I do think it's an extended period of time. Why don't you? I'm a little bit afraid they're not doing it. I, I just hope that you're coordinating with a Ways and Means Committee because uh, I used to do taxes and we used to make fun of Congress when they changed things for the prior year. Uh, but that's even on minor things where you, you know, can contact the licensed tax preparers. I would, uh, I'll, I'll talk to the Ways and Means folks, but they should be, you know, dealing with you guys on a routine basis. But, um, well, we hope, uh, I asked some questions, hope we get answers in the future. Um, I, you can tell we're very disappointed with, you know, some of the ways some of your people are hired. I mean, it's to the point of bizarre that you'd rehire somebody who was fired before, particularly. Uh, uh, it's obvious it causes just tremendous amount of public lack of confidence in the IRS. But. Um, I would like to thank you all for appearing for us, uh, before us today. The hearing record will remain open for two, uh, two more weeks for any member to submit a written opening statement or questions for the record. If there's no further business, looks like I'm all alone here, without objection, the subcommittees stand adjourned.